Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Elhamdülillah, elhamdülillahi vahde. Ve salatu ve selamu ala millâ nebiyye ba'da ma ba'd. Following on from last week, just to quickly recap what we done last week. Um, what did we do last week? Somebody can tell me inshallah, so you can revise. Why we done zero? Why we done zero, mashallah. How many points? We done five points. We could we go through them inshallah anybody mention one or two? And so increase the love for the Prophet. Increase the love for the Prophet. This is probably one of the most powerful reasons that we study the seal of the Prophet. And that the love of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa actually comes into our hearts. It's always impossible to love somebody unless we have some kind of understanding who they were, what they done, how they affected our lives. So this is one reason. Any other reasons? To, it's a commando. This is the this is the most important reason. So having love for the Prophet is something very important, but the most important reason, and there's nothing which can be above this, is that Allah in the Quran tells us to do ittiba of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He tells us to follow him. It's impossible for us to follow his life, his sunnah, his way, his way of doing things, if we don't know how he done them, if we don't study these things, if we don't pay attention to these things. So this is why obviously understanding how he done things, why he done things, the way he done them, this is something very, very important. So there's many other points, hopefully we'll, most of them, most of us, we learned them by heart and hopefully we now remember them all, all the way going forward. And inshallah we'll see what to go through today inshallah. <coughs> Again today inshallah the main title is to look at the world before Islam. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if we look at the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he came in terms of the common era, the Prophet ﷺ came about 600 years after when the people think that um, Isa Islam passed away. So in the Christian era, in the common era, the Prophet ﷺ, he came about, the Prophet ﷺ, his birth was 700 years after that. So what we look at today is that at the time when the Prophet ﷺ was born, or just before the Prophet ﷺ was born, what was the condition of the world and what was the condition of the people at the world and obviously studying this is very very important the reason why the people before the prophet sallallahu came why the people were in the condition that they were in and how they got there and also a, a slightly detailed description of what kind of condition the people were in so this is something we'll learn a lot from this is the first thing people start see at different different places and different different aspects, but this is one very important aspect. Let's just keep these on you, and you can give them to whoever comes. So, this is how the seerah develops, and this is how we understand. So, the first thing we look at is at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, the whole world, the whole earth, the known world. How was it ruled? Who was living in those parts of the world? And how were they behaving with themselves? And how were they acting? So, this is what we learn about the world at that time. So, if you look briefly at the life of the people around the world. We will look briefly, two things we'll notice, there's two big empires. So at that time there's the Roman Empire and also there's the Persian Empire, so two main empires. There's no, these are the two superpowers at that time. So we had the Romans obviously ruling from Rome, uh, south of Europe and coming out a bit towards Turkey and the Iran was ruled by the Persians, by the fire worshippers, by the Zoroastrians. So these are the two main empires. Then we have also, we still have the north of Europe, we still have India, China and these areas as well. But mainly these are these two big empires, two superpowers in the world and then we have the rest of the world. So we'll look briefly, the main religion at that time, sensible religion, was Christianity. However, unfortunately Christianity had also been changed. So the Roman Empire, obviously Rome is famous for which religion? Christianity. Christianity. Even today the Pope tends to be there. So we know that Rome and Christianity come together. The Roman Empire was meant to spread Christianity. This is what the Roman Empire was claimed to do. The people of Rome, they fought under, they would give khutbas in the churches and say it's time for jihad, go and fight, especially at the time of the Crusades, even after Islam came and you know when they went back. Based on Islam, people in these areas, they went back. So even before Islam came, these people, they claimed to be following Christianity as well. However, the biggest problem that we have is what had happened is that instead of now following Christianity, instead of professing Tawheed and the worship of Allah, the biggest problem that we had, and we'll see, every, everyone in the world at this time, all of their problems were based on the fact that they did not have Tawheed. 
And this is what we see about the beauty of the da'wah of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi Why does he first call to tawheed? The, the, fund, uh, the, the essence and the foundation of all the problems in the world was due to the lack of tawheed. So in the Roman Empire, they were meant to have tawheed. Christianity is based on tawheed, worshipping how many gods? Worshipping one god, isn't it? So Christianity is based on tawheed. Judaism was based on tawheed. But now these people, instead of worshipping one god, some of them had given Jesus السلام, a higher status than he was meant to have and then made him a god as well. Some of them had made, started t- taking their saints and their priests and they're taking them as gods. Some people, they would draw pictures of the of their imam and they would start worshipping him. So if the saints were to pass away, they would draw a picture and then after he's died, they would worship the picture of the saint. These are the kind of things they were doing now in Christianity and calling themselves Christians. And this is the Roman Empire. Remember this. So the world had two superpowers, the Roman Empire and the Persian Empire. This is the Roman Empire, which is mainly Christian. So this is one thing that Tawheed was gone. And Tawheed is always the fundamental loss which destroys a nation for many, many reasons. And we'll come to that later. Another problem with the Romans is that they had this ikhtilaf, they had a debate within themselves. You know, like sometimes Muslims, we have debate about something. Their debate was on the supernatural powers of Isa alayhi salam. So how supernatural was Isa alayhi salam? How much? As in, it's a bit like some of the Fultulis and Barilvis of nowadays, who go a bit extreme and say the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam knew everything and he is, he is part of Allah and all these kind of things. So they gave a high status to Isa alayhi salam. And this caused the divide within the Roman Empire itself. So now imagine the Roman Empire, the emperor ruling all of his empire. Now within the Roman Empire, who claim to be Christian, there's this big divide. And it's so severe that it caused a civil war within the Romans. Now the Romans were very powerful. We know it was a very, very strong empire. The Roman Empire was amazing. However, they had a war within themselves. So one person saying Jesus has certain powers and the other saying no, he was just a human. And this caused a civil, war, a civil war within the Romans themselves. So now while they're having this civil war, all of the churches, all of the schools, all of the hospitals, all of the libraries even, all of it was used for war. It was used to store weapons, it was used to get the horses ready, it was used for people to equip themselves, training camps. Essentially, all of the mosques and the places which were meant to be improving society were now used to destroy society. So this was the biggest problem that they had. They had a civil war within themselves and all of these places which were meant to be used for good were now used for bad. And the last point, and these are all, we're still on the Roman Empire, the last point is that the leaders, the people with the power, the people in charge, they were obsessed with amassing as much wealth as possible. And this is a very, very big problem. So now when somebody has the power, they're deciding how much tax we should charge everyone. But if somebody's aim is to get as much money as possible, then there's no upper limit to how much tax they're going to charge. The tax is going to go through the roof. Because if the people that want the money, they have no upper limit, they have no satisfaction, they have no contentment. They, their only purpose is to get as much money. So the tax is going to go up and up. And also, if they're not going to give you any money back, they're not going to build roads or schools or hospitals or churches. They're going to use the money to store it in their banks. And there's many stories that we have like this, especially with the people of Iran. With the people of Rome as well, they used to accumulate big bars of gold and have treasures and so many keys around their treasures. And they used to have so much wealth around them. But generally focusing on the spiritual side of things, they had lost their Tawheed. This is the first problem. The second big empire was the... Persian Empire. Now these generally they ruled in Iran. Iran's quite a big place, extended surrounding areas of Iran as well. They were ruling there. Generally they also had this Tawheed problem. They wouldn't worship one God. And generally they would all worship the sun or fire. So these are big problems. So now one person has a fire here, which is his God. So this fire tells you what is right, what is wrong, how to live your life, what is the sunnah, what, you know, what you're meant to be doing, how you're meant to be praying. All of these things, the fire is telling you how to do it which obviously leads to problems. In the Roman Empire, it led to a problem as well. If you make a picture your God, you've decided that picture is your God. It's your divine source of guidance. The picture is going to tell you how to live your life. So this is a problem. So now when a person takes something as a God or chooses more than one being as a God, the source of guidance becomes very, very conflated, very, very confused. There's no source of guidance. Your guidance now becomes a picture. And obviously it can't tell you what is right, what is wrong. So now morals, which is something which nowadays we discuss a lot, where do their morals end up coming from? The morals will come from themselves. 
what is right and wrong will be decided by themselves. So whoever has the power will manipulate their power. So this is the problem we had in the Roman Empire and the Persian Empire because they had no regard for Allah or a divine source of uh, knowledge, no regard for the Bible or what's written in the Torah. They would make up their own religion and do whatever they wanted. If you had power, they would abuse their power. And this is how they would live. So the people of Iran, the Persian Empire, generally they would worship their kings. This is something that would, they, would, they, would get, make, uh, they would consider their kings to be superhuman. They would do sajda to their kings, prostrate to their kings. Kings were literally their god. And the king, their kings would decide their religion. And in the Roman Empire, the emperors would have their clergy and the clergy would be under the power, they would be under the bribery of the, they would change the religion according to whatever the leaders want them to do. So these are the problems of not having a divine source of uh, guidance. And also with the Persian Empire, the last point, they used to compete with the Romans in extravagance. So if the Romans built a big palace, they would say, we want to build a bigger palace. If the Romans had one, one million gold bars in their treasury, they would say, we need to have two million. If the Romans went and invaded a big piece of land, they'd go and fight with the Romans and you know, try and make their own land bigger. They were always competing with, mainly in extravagance, mainly in building big buildings for absolutely no reason, just to show off. This is one of the things they were competing with. And obviously, this is only going to be funded by the taxes. So the, this was before the finance uh, industry is the way that we see it today. People wouldn't go into debt as much. They would have to fund their own things which they're trying to do. If they want to build a castle or a palace for the king, which costs billions of pounds, that will be paid for by every single poor worker whose taxes will go up to fund this kind of extravagance. And if the Romans are doing something, then the Persians are trying to compete. So the problem happens both ways. So this is the problem that happens. So this was the two main empires and this is obviously we could go deeper and look more at different aspects but just to look from a social point of view, a social and economical point of view, we looked at from a religious point of view, they have no tawhid. But from a social point of view, how are the people now? So you have leaders, middle class people and the peasants, the people at the bottom. Now the leaders obviously have all the power, the problem is they, their only worry now is to amass as much wealth as possible. They have no concern for anyone else. So they'll take taxes and they won't care about the fact that there's no hospitals or there's no schools or there's no churches or libraries. They will not care about this, so they'll just take the money for themselves. The leaders have that power to do that. The middle class people who have some kind of good job, they, even they will abuse the people underneath them because they have enough wealth to do so. If, they can, if they've got enough wealth to abuse the people below them, they will abuse them, abuse their services, take their services as much as they can. And even if they don't need their services, they will. it's like the sweatshops we see nowadays, when you have big massive companies who use the cheapest people they can possibly have to try and keep as much money as they can for themselves. And this is what we saw from even the middle class. Meaning that the poor people who are working and they're going to pay the tax, they are losing out the much. The difference between the rich and the poor just expands all, all the time. So this is the problem that we see in this empire. So even on an economic level, the problem is that none of the roads are going to be built. None of the hospitals or churches or none of the public services, nothing's going to go into the welfare. If somebody's an orphan, they're not going to have any help. There's not going to be a police service. The only thing they're worried about is expanding. So they're going to fund their army, they're going to fund their civil war, or they're going to fund their army to go and expand into different countries, or they're going to amass the wealth for themselves. There's no worry or concern actually about the people around them. So this is the problem which we have at this time with these two superpowers. Now just to briefly touch on the rest of the world, so if you consider the rest of the world, we've done the two superpowers. The rest of the world will be Northern Europe, England as well. Alhamdulillah, we're all British. So in school, we would have studied, you know, what was happening in Britain in 600, 700 BC. And we have, you know, different people invaded at different times. At that time, there was a different group of people. And then the England was basically continually invaded by different, different people. For those of us that remember anything from history. But that was happening at that time. And then the rest of Europe, it was, it was more uncivilized than the superpowers. These superpowers were considered like the superpowers of the time. They were the most advanced. They were the people who looked after the people the most. Everyone else was more uncivilized than this. Even in India, we had the caste systems, problems within the Indian people. And this, even the way that people treated women, one of the common things at this time in the world, in all of these places, is people would choose sometimes not to get married at all. And they would stay bachelors for their whole lives. And obviously this means that then at will, freely, they can go around and fornicate for their whole lives. They don't have any commitment. If you get married, you have to have kids, look after your family. Getting married sometimes is a sign in society of a person who takes life seriously, who's serious about life, who wants to settle down and you know, not just 
be a free man or be a player, so to speak. So this is something very, very important. And but these people, they, for their whole lives, just stay unmarried, so that they can specifically for this intention, so that they can go around fornicating and be free sexually. And sexual wantonness was actually something. For example, even in the Arabians, we see this as we come to the Arabians. But in the rest of the world. Even in the Indian system, some of their gods were like objects which would be very, very immodest, even the, even the gods which they chose. Certain parts of the body which they'd worship, and the way that they treat women, obviously, even the caste system, as we know in India, at that time the caste system was such that you have the people at the top, and just depending on what family you're born in, you're not allowed to own property, you're not allowed to have a job, you're not allowed to have any respect in society, just because of the caste you're born in. This was the way that it was in India, uh, originally. So this was the thing at that time. And generally, the leaders didn't have these morals. They didn't have any concern for the people under them. They didn't have concern for the poor. So this is what we saw of the people at that time. And now coming on to Arabia, which is the fourth part of the world. The rest of the world obviously is a lot of the world. But the known world at that time, there's different parts. You know, some people are probably saying you didn't mention Bangladesh or Gambia or Ghana. Why didn't you mention my country? Obviously, just to the rest of the world covers all of these places. This is what was going on at that time. Arabia obviously is very important because this is where the Prophet ﷺ actually came into. They had a lot of ethics, which we'll also mention at the bottom as well. But the problem obviously they were worshipping, like some of the Sahaba that they mentioned, that we used to worship a stone, and then if we were walking and we saw another stone which looked nicer, we'd take that one and worship that one instead. So this is some of the things that they used to do in their lives. They had no, even the Kaaba, which was built by Ibrahim ﷺ, in order for Tawheed to be established by the Prophet of Tawheed, which we'll come to in a minute as well. He built this Kaaba for the one worship of Allah and we find hundreds of gods within the Kaaba. This is the kind of condition they had put the Kaaba into. Generally, the treatment of women was such that they wouldn't just oppress women and not let them inherit. They would bury, if a girl was born, they would bury it alive. That's how embarrassed they would be to have a girl in their family. So this is the condition of the Arab people. Now. Girl, uh, females, unless you were very high, some of us we think of the wife of Abu Sufyan sometimes comes to mind, and she had relative respect within the people. Unless you were of her, remember Abu Sufyan was sometimes we think Abu Jahal, Abu Lahab, all these people, all these kuffar, they were like the top people. Abu Sufyan was always one of the top leaders. The only reason he wasn't killed in, uh, in Badr was because Abu Sufyan, if you remember, he was the one who was in charge of the caravan. So he escaped from Badr and wasn't killed. All of the big leaders were killed. That we, the famous names we have in our mind, we think Abu Sufyan is not really mentioned. But even at the beginning, Abu Sufyan was more or less in charge of Mecca. He was very, very important. In fact, he was leading the caravan. He was a little bit younger, but he was still very, very important in these people. So Abu Sufyan, his wife also had a very, very high status in society. But this is very, very rare that a, a woman gets that status, in, especially in Arabia. The rest of them, they would be treated, some of them would be buried alive. If their husbands died, they would be inherited, literally. Just like the rest of them, if somebody dies, and then the wife's house and the wife's car and the wife's horse are all taken away and inherited by other people. The wife, would, the widow, would also be inherited by the sons and the people around them and the brothers of the, of the person who's died. This is how they'd be inherited. This is how much rights they were given. They forget owning things, they were owned by other people almost. This is the condition that it was at that time. And other things which were very, very common. People in Makkah, they wouldn't just worship the idol. Some of them would worship the sun, some worship the moon, some worship stars. Different, different things they'd rely on at that time. And again, as soon as you take away this Tawheed, your source of guidance is taken away. Now, who decides what's right and wrong? For an Arab, who decides what's right and wrong? The leaders decide themselves, and if you're in power, you take power for yourself, and you decide yourself. This is the problem which they have. Number two, alcohol. So now, the leaders were, it was almost like, uh, taking alcohol was more common than water, is described by some of the historians. That water was not as common as alcohol was in the, maj in the majalis of the uh, mushrikeen leaders. So the mushrikeen leaders, they'd go around and they'd always have alcohol. And they're making judgments on how to run Arabia. They're making the trade deals f f for the future. And they're making these deals based on uh, a, a drunk state of mind. They're deciding how to run Arabia and Mecca and the people around them based on a drunk state of mind. So obviously they're not going to have worry and concern for the people underneath them or the poor of society or the welfare system or the roads or the hospitals because they, they're half drunk a lot of the time. This is something very, very common at that time. And gambling was a matter of pride. What, what this means is that if somebody's gambling, 
the more you gamble, the more honor you're given in society. And the more ridiculous amount, that if you're just there and you gamble everything away, and then on top of that you gamble things you don't even have, then you're considered to be the most honored of these people. This is how the gambling was the honor thing to do. It shows how wealthy you are and how intelligent you are, that you're wasting all your money on things which you're not going to achieve. This is how gambling was perceived within them. So gambling and alcohol were the order of the day, and they would normally worship. And uh, the, third, the fourth thing, again on our list, was brothels and prostitution. And even generally, uh, before we talk about actual uh, prostitution, just generally, the way that they would talk is that they were, even if they were married, they would come into the public sphere and in the Kaaba have a discussion about the kind of things they done at night time with their wives. This kind of thing. This would be the normal conversation of the day. And everyone just says what they, how they spent the, the, the night before. This is how the conversation would go. And prostitution and brothels, obviously, this is another level of fornication. This is even worse than these people. But this is something which became very common and people found it very, very easy to do these kind of things. So this is the problem that they had there. And immodesty was very, very normal. And the last point, which we all probably know very, very well, and we probably see around us in different times, we probably heard this a lot, which is that if somebody was in a specific tribe, and that tribe leader decided to go to war, a tribe basically means a family or a clan or a certain father. You have a certain father, and from that father you go forward. Now, if somebody was of a certain tribe, then these people, they would follow the leader and have as many fights as needed. Let's pass these to the back. So, um, they would have as many fights as needed in order just to do what the person in front of them wants them to do. So just because the tribe leader said, let's have a fight, they'd have a massive war. Even if the reason for having the fight made no sense. Even if it was illogical to have this fight. So these tribe leaders will still go ahead and have these fights. This is the problem that we have with the, with the leaders of those tribes. That generally if somebody decided to have a fight, and they would have big, big fights. Sometimes we, we hear that these people sometimes, just because somebody's sheep drunk before another person's sheep, or they were coming to the well and somebody, they drunk first and the other person drunk afterwards, then they would have a fight which would last for generations and they wouldn't, they wouldn't know why they're even fighting. So this is one of the problems that they would have. So just to summarize these few points, what we notice is that the people generally all around the world, before, before the Prophet ﷺ was born, there was three main problems which we should focus on. Number one is that the lack of morals which these people had. So generally, these people, they would not have any divine source of morals. Their source of morals was themselves, whatever they thought was right to do. So whenever that happens, whoever has power, then dictates everything that happens in that society. They're never answerable to any divine uh, creed. They're not answerable to any kind of Quran and Sunnah. They're just following whatever they think is the right thing to do. So this is the first problem. The second big problem was the fact that economically, they were so obsessed with accumulating wealth for themselves that these people would make the taxes extortioner. Everybody's paying these taxes, but they don't want to give the, these tax back to the people. They don't want to make a welfare system. So they keep the wealth for themselves and amass the wealth for themselves. This is the second problem. And these are the common problems all around the world. So one, number one, no morals. And number two, that the taxes are high and they're not putting this back into the system. It's not being reinvested. It's being kept for just some people are just taking and extracting all of the wealth from the people. This is point number two. And the last point is that obviously as a result of these two things, the people who are lower down in society, they are abused. So if you're an orphan, you have no one to support you. Isn't it? If you're a widow and you have no one to support you, you'll be abused. If you're a slave, they have no rights, they'll just be abused. So because there's no one to speak up for them, these people will just be abused. So this is a brief overview of the world uh, at that time. Regarding, because we're going to be looking at the Arabs who eventually go on to become the Sahaba, there's certain qualities about them which we should just bear in mind. Even before the Prophet came, they had some good qualities as well. So generally they had these qualities of the way that they treat people as well, but there were some good things. So these a couple of points. Number one, hospitality. So if somebody ever came from outside, these people, they would always look after these people. 
so this is one very very important thing which the, with the Arabs would do so they would always be hospitable if they have ever had a chance to look after guests if they ever had a chance to take somebody to the house and feed somebody if the, sometimes in fact they would compete with one another that I want to look after this guest I want to take this person home and at the time of Hajj they would all make a point to be very very hospitable to all of the pilgrims make sure they have food and water and all of these things they would be very very careful even the leaders who were very selfish but they would look after other people this is one thing they would do number two is promises they would keep promises and this is something which keeps society together this is some of the good points about the Arabs that whenever they made a promise they would treat it like a debt so if they said that I'm going to be at an appointment with you tomorrow at three o'clock then they would it would be almost as if they've given you 300 pound and they know that I have to now give this 300 pound back if somebody lends me 300 pound I have to give 300 pound back if I promise somebody or I make an appointment with somebody that I'm going to be here at three o'clock then I that is just the same way same as a debt I have to be there at that time I have to fulfill this promise if I say I'm going to help you in this way then we have to fulfill that help that we're going to give him if I say I'm going to come and do this thing for you then when we say we're going to come at this time we come at this time and this is something we should treat with a lot of importance sometimes especially in our culture in British culture we find this is given a lot of precedence and they give it very a lot of importance and generally if you turn up to one of their events generally in this country if you turn up somewhere the time written is the time it starts in fact 10 minutes before everyone will be there seated and waiting and at the time everybody will come up. if you ever go to an event organized by anybody from Pakistan India or Bangladesh and even Afghanistan or anyone from these kind of countries the times given everybody arrives at least half an hour later and this is the fixed time I don't, I don't know why this is people think it's okay to turn up late and it's in our minds but in this country then we do the same thing with, with, with them as well and then they think we're we're so backwards which is true it's such a backwards thing to do you have an appointment and you turn up half an hour after the appointment for the appointment so this is something which Salah is very good for this because obviously you come to the masjid half an hour after Salah you have missed it so that's why it's important that Salah gives us this punctuality so if you're in the masjid the Salah is going to start on time maybe one or two minutes late maybe but generally Salah will start on the minute so now we can't we this is a good practice for us to become punctual so even this is our appointment with Allah so when we have an appointment with another person this is even more important that we make sure we turn up on time for the time we've given this person and we this is something we have to give a lot of organization or organizing our lives to try and change our culture so we become like this anyway this is something that Arabs would generally do that keep their promises and there's certain qualities which were good people describe the qualities in different ways generally they were just like they were very firm they were very they had a lot of jazba as we say in Urdu they, they would go ahead with things they, they would keep things in mind and they were very determined and firm and courageous and go through with the things that they say and the last thing also and this is something we see that why did Allah choose these people for Islam and for guidance is because they were very simple Bedouin people and it to change their minds wasn't something very very complex they hadn't they didn't already have complex things in their mind they were already awake so their minds and hearts were already simple so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he comes with a new message it's very simple for him to make an effect on them so this is one reason which people give which is why Islam came to these people so this is a brief overview of the world at the time before the Prophet Sallallahu was born and also the evils which were in the world and the people of Arabia how they were and some of the good things about the people of Arabia and this is very important to know Obviously, the most important reason is because Islam wasn't existing before this. So the Prophet ﷺ, he came with Islam into this world, into this kind of world, with these problems in it. Now, at this time, there was no source of light. None of these people had any kind of source of guidance. You couldn't imagine any source of guidance for these kind of people. You couldn't imagine where are these people going to get guidance from. Nobody could imagine it. If we, if we try and imagine this world, where would people see the light from? At what point would people change their minds and stop following their desires? At what point would the leaders stop doing whatever they wanted to? At what point would the leaders realize that they have to change the way that they do things and put things back into the welfare and give the poor some of their rights again, give the people who have been deprived? The, the, the reason we study this, and the more we study this, the more we understand the achievement of Rasulullah So When he comes with Islam, one person comes and he has such an effect on the people that the whole world changes. He doesn't just change Arabia, he changed all of these places. He changed the Persian Empire and the Roman Empire as well, as we saw from just within a few years of him coming. And he was only alive as a prophet for 23 years. And this is the effect he had on the world. 
So now when we study Sirah, we'll see what he came to, what kind of people he came to. He didn't come to an ideal world where people were all there, you know, mashallah, the prophets come, we're all guided now. People were in darkness. There was no source of light at that time. So the only source of light, one source of light came, and Allah sent this one source of light, and this one source of light changed the world. So now when we look at Sirah, we study Sirah, we see how is it that this one source of light changed the world? What, what kind of person must he have been? What an achievement for him and the Sahaba, that what kind of effect these people had on the world? How the world was and what they made the world into. And even if we look from a secular point of view, even we don't have Iman at the moment, even if we want to. And we were to look specifically, just to analyze how he achieved things, we will see that his effect on society was more than anyone else in history. And Islam and the way Islam implemented uh, economically and politically and socially, the way Islam changed the world, this is something that when Islam and Muslims stopped ruling the world, when Islam and Muslims stopped ruling the world, when the Prophet ﷺ came, Islam started ruling certain parts of the world and he changed the world. When this stopped, this was a detrimental for mankind. It was detrimental for humankind, just for the whole world. The fact that Islam is not ruling the world had a detrimental effect on mankind. And we'll see this on how before Islam, how the world was. Islam came, what it done to the world. And then when Islam left, how the world changed again. And this is a very specific way of looking at things. But this is something we learn a lot from as well. So this is something to keep in mind. Moving on to the next point, which is the, at the bottom, the background of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Most people when they start looking at Sirah, they compare the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to one other Prophet, the father of all Prophets, who is known as Ibrahim Alaihi Wasallam. So this is the first comparison that is made. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is linked and compared always to Ibrahim Alaihi Wasallam. Obviously the days of Dhul Hijjah are coming, the days of Hajj are coming. So we're going to be hearing lots about Ibrahim Alaihi Wasallam. But more importantly here, we look at why Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is linked with Ibrahim. Why does the Quran tell us to do ittiba of the Millah of Ibrahim alayhi salam? Millah of Ibrahim Hanifa. It describes the religion of Ibrahim as Hanif. It doesn't tell us to follow the Millah of Musa alayhi salam. The Quran doesn't tell us that, you know, follow the way of Bani Israel or the way of Musa. It tells us specifically to go back to Ibrahim alayhi salam. Why? Mainly because of this monotheism. Monotheism? Tawheed. Because of the oneness of Allah which Ibrahim alayhi salam came with. He came as a child and throughout his life, and this is not the seerah of Ibrahim alayhi salam. So we're not going to go into detail on that. But his whole life evolved around Tawheed. And when we study Hajj and the aspects of Hajj, we again see Tawheed. It's all about Tawheed. It's all about the oneness of Allah, realizing Allah, doing whatever Allah wants you to do. So this is what... The, uh, and then we see the same things in the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa so, because we see these things in the life of the Prophet ﷺ and Ibrahim ﷺ, so Ibrahim ﷺ, he has to do these things just based on his tawheed. He had to sacrifice his son based on his tawheed. This one idea which he has of how great Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. So Allah tells him to do something despite it going against all logic, he still does it. This is how we understand Ibrahim ﷺ. His trust in Allah, tawakkul, taqwa and tawheed. These two things, tawakkul and taqwa, qualities which we need to develop inside ourselves. Our tawakkul in Allah. We look at the tawakkul of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in Allah. One man came to this world, and then imagine how much tawakkul you have to have, and how much tawakkul are we meant to have as well? How much trust we're meant to have in Allah? How much optimism we're meant to have in Allah? This, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, one man came to this world and he changed the world because of his tawakkul and his taqwa and his trust in Allah subhanahu wa taala. Because he believed Allah will allow him to change the world, and Allah allowed him to change the world. And this is something we see in Ibrahim alayhi salam as well. Allah tells him to do things which don't make sense to him, which are so hard for him, yet he still goes through with them, trusting in Allah. So this is the key thing that we did. This is the first reason. The link in Tawheed between the Prophet sallallahu alayhi and Ibrahim alayhi It's more, it's, this link becomes more apparent when you look at some of the incidents in the life of Ibrahim alayhi salam. For example, sacrificing his son. For example, leaving his family in the desert. For example, when he has to jump, when he has to leave his people and go into the fire. All of these things that show this. But, um, and then we see incidents from the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi where he has to do similar things. Where he has to sacrifice so many things. He has to sacrifice his family. And he has